Hi guys, welcome to lab on the central nervous system. Um, now, the place to really start this conversation is as follows. This lab is going to be quite similar to a lot of the lecture that's provided on these subjects, okay? The lab and the lecture are very, very similar. They just are its reality. I will be showing you some things in lab that you will not hear about or see in lecture, so that's going to be nice. But the reality is that these last two, the lab and the lecture, are so similar that study for one kind of studies for the other. Um, so just prepare yourselves for a little bit of repetition. All right, three major subdivisions of the brain. These are the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. Now the cerebrum makes up most of the brain's volume. When you think of a brain, this wrinkly surface, all of this up here, that's all cerebrum. And it's broken down into parts that are referred to as being gyri and sulci, if you will. Parts is a strong term there. The description of the surface of the cerebral cortex is of having high spots and low spots. Uh, you may, may have heard someone say that your brain is wrinkly, okay, and it's got a wrinkly appearance to it. A gyrus is a high spot, like the upper portion here, this, that, and a sulcus is like an indentation, like the deepenings. Oh, hang on the deepening areas here where it's sunken in. Uh, the concept is that by wrinkling the brain, you increase the amount of gray matter surface area. Um, let me try that again. By, by wrinkling the brain surface, there is uh, more area, more surface area, which means you can have more gray matter for processing power. Works like a charm. All right, lots of the brain's volume. Yeah, all right, that's perfect. Now I will also point out this corpus callosum real quick. Uh, you probably grasped that your brain has two hands, uh, the two right and left hemispheres, if you will, and um, these two halves are connected at the center by a major nerve called the corpus callosum, and you'll be seeing that as we progress. All right, next is the cerebellum, as you can see back here. The cerebellum is thought of as being the hindbrain. Uh, the cerebellum and the cerebrum are linked together, but they are separate structures. The brain is basically two major parts for our purposes. The cerebral cortex, uh, the cerebrum up here, where most of your um, like conscious thought processing and uh, the things you do on a daily basis that you're actively thinking about, uh, when you hear something, when you see things, this is all cerebral cortex. The cerebrum, I'm sorry, the cerebellum in the back uh, has other very fascinating functions. Key amongst these being the uh, sort of putting together of visual and auditory information to help you stand upright and move your body in appropriate fashion. So sort of coordinating your major motor outputs, that's your cere uh, cerebellum in the back. Making up about half of the brain's neurons, huge processing power in the cerebellum. And again, the cerebrum and the cerebellum being linked by the thalamus and being linked by these unique structures in the back here that you'll be seeing later today, uh, refer referred to as the corpora quadrigemina, okay? Uh, think of this quadrigemina, the four twins. It's supposed to be one, two, three, four little lumps. And then, of course, the brain stem. Uh, so the brain stem is um, your, your lowest brain centers. So if you want to like keep your heart beating, uh, there are reflexive centers in the brain stem that keep your heart beating if you're asleep, you know, this kind of thing. Um, assisting with swallowing, you know, these sorts of things. Very low brain function, primitive brain brain stem. Right, starting at the thalamus is kind of working its way down. You got your pons and do a little gata. You'll be seeing it all shortly. Uh, now, in the cerebrum, I want you to know the names of the lobes and kind of what they do. So in other words, like you got your frontal lobe up here that deals with mood. Uh, is what I call social judgment. This is uh, your general um, personality type is governed by your frontal lobe. The, the decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis, those are frontal lobe decisions. Uh, your parietal lobes, which would be on the sides underneath your parietal bones. Uh, these are going to be general sensory. We think of this as interpreting taste primarily. Uh, the occipital lobe back here in the back, we think of this as primarily dealing with vision or vision centers, uh, putting together a visual information. <clears throat> this temporal lobe here. Now, I think of this as hearing and smell, uh, but underneath this is where you find the limbic system, so people lump a lot of other stuff into this. For my purposes, hearing and smell, and then last but not least, the insular region. Insular means hidden, so you pull the temporal lobe out just a little bit, and inside of this you can see the temporal lobe, and I would like for you to think of this as the area where we understand spoken language. Not produce language, but understand it. Yeah. Now, in the brain, 
you need to know the following parts and pieces, both off of a model, off of an image, off of dissection materials, okay? And this is gonna go as follows. Now, follow my path here. You can't just randomly memorize this stuff. It helps you to find a nice, easy anchoring point and then to work your way away from this, okay? So it's gonna go something like this. I go with the corpus callosum at the top. The corpus callosum is that big nerve that um, assists the two hemispheres with communication between each other. So the two cerebral hemispheres have to communicate. And to do so, they use the corpora. No, 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 geez, corpus callosum, there we go. If you wanna read some weird scientific reporting, pause this video and go type into Google cut corpus callosum and the read about people that have had their cor uh, corpus callosum cut as a result of epileptic seizures. The effects are interesting. Interesting. Okay, moving on. Uh, corpus callosum here, and then you come down the fornix, which would be in here. Okay, there's the fornix. If you, oh, 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 hang on. If you follow the fornix down, you come to uh, what we call the intermediate mass of the thalamus. We'll just call this the thalamus. The reality is that we've cut the brain down the middle here, and the thalamus is these two lumps. We have a little connection point kind of right in the middle. Like right in the middle of my brain, you'd have these big lumps and then this little point of connection between the two. So the ovoid masses of the thalamus, the actual mass of the thalamus, would be kind of inside there, but that little spot there is where they come together and connect, not unlike this. Okay, but that's what we're gonna call the thalamus. Uh, you come down into the hypothalamus here, and you follow this down, and there's the optic chiasma. The optic chiasma is where the optic nerves come in from the eyes, and um, they sort of cross over. So it's this structure, it looks like this in reality. So you've got optic nerve, optic nerve, and they come into this structure called the optic chiasma that sticks out underneath the brain. And that's what they're trying to show you there. Then down to the pituitary gland, as you can see here, uh, the pituitary gland actually has multiple parts, which we're not gonna get into. Uh, now we can come back up and down to the pons, which is here, and then down to the medulla oblongata, which is there. So follow my pathways, okay? Corpus callosum, fornix, hypothalamus, down, did I do them all? Hang on, let's try that again. Corpus callosum, fornix, thalamus, hypothalamus, pons, medulla oblongata. Mix into this, they're off the chiasma, the pituitary gland, and you're doing pretty good. Now the high brain's pretty straightforward. We have our cerebellum back here, and with the cerebellum we have the arbor vitae. Arbor vitae means tree of life. It's a really cool structure. If you kind of turn your head sideways, this looks like a tree. Uh, what you see here is a bunch of gray matter with very little associated white matter. Whereas in the cerebral cortex, you have lots of white matter with very little associated gray matter by comparison. So they're, they're similar but different. It's just a different way of getting at the same concept. Also back in here, we have the uh, pineal gland and the corporal quadrigemina, as I mentioned previously. A better way to see this is if you take a real brain and you just kind of grab the cerebral cortex and you grab the hind brain, the cerebellum, and you pull them apart. They are not connected. They are separate structures. And when you sort of pull them apart, what you reveal are these two big lumps and there will be two others that you can't see. They are covered in this particular image. Those are the corpora quadrigemina. And then in the back of this, if you get close and you look where the red pen is, I hate the screen by the way, where that red pen is, uh, that is the pineal gland. If you pull this structure down, the pineal gland is kind of like dangling back in there uh, and it looks kind of like the uvula in the back of your throat. Like if you imagine this being an open mouth, it's almost like the uvula hanging in the back. And again, the pineal gland is gonna be involved in your sleep cycle. It's gonna be regulated by your hypothalamus, but involved in the sleep cycle. Perfect, perfect. I tell you what, uh, let's go and see this on an actual model. All right, check it out, folks. Here we have a volunteer to allow us to take a look at some brains. Let's see if we can make this thing sit in a way that'll work for us. I guess this is gonna have to do. All right, so what we have here is the corpus callosum. Take the corpus callosum around and down the fornix, which is there. And then you have your intermediate mass of the thalamus, and you can kind of almost tell it's ovoid, this little bump here. That would be the thalamus. Fill that down to the hypothalamus, which is kind of in this area, just where the pituitary gland would be hanging down. 
Uh, you have your optic chiasma, which would be this little bit sticking out right there. There's one of the optic nerves. And then you have your pons and your medulla oblongata down here. Okay. And again, arbor vitae inside the cerebellum right back there. Here we have another volunteer. You can see that this is actually sort of an upside down brain, but it's a brain all the same. And on this, what I really want to point out to you is you can kind of see the pituitary gland. See that little bitty thing holding it in there? That's what they call the infundibulum. And uh, it is quite small in reality. When you're doing a brain dissection, when I say that it's virtually impossible to leave the pituitary on the brain, I'm serious. Because the infundibulum, this little bitty structure, is literally thread-like, as you can see there. Uh, it's The pituitary gland is basically stuck to the dura mater of the brain, which we'll be talking about in a second. And if, if you remove the dura mater, you remove the pituitary. They are very easily separated from one another. And also on this, I want you to notice the optic nerves sticking out here and there, and that they are sort of connected to one another at this structure called the optic chiasma. Again, it kind of looks like this, and would fit down into um, the cella tersica on a skull. I have a skull sitting around here anywhere. And we're back. So again, let me point out to you these optic nerves, and they would be like an, the optic chiasma, these two areas where you'd have an optic nerve coming on both sides. You can see those one there kind of one there you can see that one there one there and if you remove the skull cap from a brain and don't drop it you can kind of see where it sits there would be an opening where an optic nerve would pass there would be an opening where an optic nerve would pass these would be coming in through the eye socket so that hole you can see there and it would be this structure looking like this that would jam in right there one going that way one going that way. So that's going to sit right in there, and that's what we're dealing with. And the reality is that your uh, pituitary gland would sit in that cella tersica, whereas the optic chiasma would be sitting on top of that. And that's pretty cool, man. I think that's a very neat uh, way that this is actually structured together. It's kind of a fascinating arrangement. Okay, so that's got all this taken care of. Let's go here. Uh, what I want you to notice about this, this is displaying to you the ventricles of the brain and a quick discussion on cerebrospinal fluid, uh, and in particular, a mention of the structures of the choroid plexus. Hold that thought. All right, I have a brain here, okay? This is, again, our plastic model, and uh, these are famous for falling to pieces on people, so if I drop all of this and winds up in a pile, my apologies. But the idea is this, okay? Your brain is not solid. It's actually quite hollow. You have these lateral ventricles, you have these openings all inside of here. All this in blue would be open space in the grand scheme of things, which is filled in your brain with cerebrospinal fluid, okay? Remember back to uh, discussions on your blood-brain barrier and all that fun stuff. Uh, your brain has open chambers full of cerebrospinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid which is produced by structures called the choroid plexus. And it's kind of hard to see. I'm going to show you some real choroid plexus from a dissection, but if you look at this, there is some choroid plexus. If I open this up, like so, popularity. If I open this up like so, they're kind of showing you that there is open space, like that's an opening into a lateral ventricle. That's very important. Okay, you can really see in a real brain, this would be quite open indeed. You can kind of grab a real brain, just kind of pull it open, and it's a big open chamber inside of there, which would be a lateral ventricle. And inside of that would be more choroid plexus, more structure, which would be making cerebrospinal fluid. That is exactly what we're dealing with here. That is what this is. So we've got a brain here. You can see our ventricles. I want you to understand that these are... I want you to understand that these are openings within the brain full of cerebrospinal fluid, which is made by structures called the choroid plexus. All right, good enough. All right, the meninges. <clears throat> In the realm of coverings of the brain, you've got to think of these as being parts of the meninges. Okay, the meninges. Uh, like you may have heard of like bacterial meningitis, viral meningitis, this would be an inflammation of the meninges. 
The meninges are a set of three coverings which sort of assist in protecting the brain. These are referred to as the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. The dura mater is a very thick fibrous membrane that sort of is stuck to the skull uh, around the brain. Uh, the pia mater is a very delicate, thin membrane, kind of a shiny lining on the outer surface of the brain itself. So you got dura mater on the skull, pia mater on the brain, and then like these set of suspensory uh, ligaments made out of elastic fiber, referred to as the arachnoid mater between them. And what this does is it kind of helps the brain be able to bounce around in space and not become damaged. Remember, uh, if your brain comes into contact with your skull at any time, that's a concussion that bruises the brain and causes mass damage. Man, you should pause this video, and maybe you shouldn't, uh, and go and watch, oh, I'll have to link you to it. I recently watched a Joe Rogan podcast with, uh, what's the guy, his dad died, he was a race car driver, uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. And they had a long conversation about concussions and brain damage. You should totally watch that podcast on YouTube. It's wild. Uh, man you just learn so much you, you see how bad things can happen with the brain and sort of the influences of the brain it's just very eye-opening so if you've got a couple hours and you're doing some menial task and you can just listen to some people talk you should listen to it it's a learning experience to say the least um where am i at Dura arachnoid and pia mater so the arachnoid mater again set of elastic fiber sort of helps to suspend the brain in place this is uh good stuff and you should know it you should understand where each of these is and i will see if i can show these to you on a microscope slide as well next is the spinal cord now what i want you to realize is and really all i want to get at is the spinal cord is quite a solid structure on the way down and then it's not okay it's solid until it isn't let me grab a vertebrae okay People like to think of your spinal cord as this really large, your nerve cord itself, as this big structure, but it is not. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Here is a good thoracic vertebrae, all right? And in this, here is your opening where the nerve cord passes. The nerve cord would be about the diameter of my little finger, okay? Roughly the diameter of my little finger, very, very small indeed. Okay, so if you look at the end of your pinky, that's about as big around as your nerve cord physically is. Very small indeed. Okay, very small indeed. Now it's gonna be solid. It's gonna have some bumps in it. All right, you've got this cervical enlargement. There's a lumbar enlargement where there's a lot of neurons that are leaving from the spinal column at that particular moment. Uh, the nerves themselves are exiting. So do I have a model? I do. You can think of this as being inside a big vertebrae. Okay, and the nerves themselves are exiting between the transverse processes of these vertebrae. So you can kind of see the transverse processes sticking out. You can kind of see how the nerves are exiting from the brain there, or I'm sorry, from the spinal cord. Now, what I really want to point out here is this conus medullaris and the cauda equina. In your lower back, you no longer have a solid nerve cord. What happens is, uh, the nerve cord descends to a point called the conus medullaris. That means the cone in the middle, okay, of your spine. And then this becomes the cauda equina. Now, cauda equina, anything equus that is dealing with horses, and the cauda equina, what's on the caudal end of a horse, okay, the tail, is supposed to resemble the tail of a horse. This literally means the horse's tail. So you have all these branching fibers, all these branching fibers, all the way down to the end, and the structure that we call the phylum terminale, the terminal fiber of the nerve cord. And it's beautiful, what a beautiful thing. Oh my gosh, so cool. All right, uh, is that all I wanna say? I feel like that's all I wanna say. Um, vertebral disc, annulus fibrosus, nucleus pulposus. Yeah, man, that's important, you should know that. Ah, okay, the anatomy of the spinal cord itself is quite worthy for us. The main things I want to point out to you here are these dorsal root ganglions and ventral roots. So dorsal root and ventral root with dorsal root ganglia. These ganglia would house the um, nerve cell bodies of your peripheral nervous systems, the nerves that are sending messages out. 
uh, their nerve cell bodies are going to be in these big ganglia, these swellings. So they'll have connection to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord will communicate with them, and then they'll send messages out to the rest of the body via the peripheral nervous system. Um, so these swellings are very important. These are the housings, these ganglia are the housings of nerve cell bodies. Uh, and then inside the nerve itself, it's sort of the opposite story of the brain. The brain has gray matter on the outside, white matter on the inside typically, uh, whereas your spinal cord has gray matter on the inside and white matter on the outside, which is kind of neat. So you've got this gray matter. Uh, it's made up of what we call the horns of gray matter. So you've got a dorsal one, a lateral one, and a ventral one. So this is the front of the body, that's the back of the body. Uh, and then the white matter is referred to as being the funiculi. You've got posterior funiculi, and, uh, lateral funiculi, and anterior funiculi. White matter versus gray matter, and you need to know that. Now, in the center of this, there is what's called the gray commissure, and then traveling through the center is what's referred to as the central canal. The central canal would allow for cerebrospinal fluid to be transported all the way through to the basal end of the nerve cord. Uh, so cerebrospinal fluid is gonna be pumped through this thing constantly to keep it nourished and functional. Now, all right, that's good enough for a picture. Let's look at a model, shall we? Let's look at a model, shall we? So here we go. Uh, what I have here, what I have here is a nice model of the spinal cord, and I can guarantee you're going to be seeing this again, okay? You've got your dorsal root ganglia, dorsal roots, ventral roots here, and you can see how the nerve fibers would come in and connect to the gray matter. So you've got your white matter where there will be oligodendrocytes, and then the gray matter where you'd find the nerve cell bodies where the actual processing is. Gray commissure in the middle, and you have your central canal here. Again, gray matter referred to as horns, lateral, I'm sorry, uh, dorsal, lateral, and um, uh, we call it ventral, and then you have the funiculi of white matter as well. Also worthy of pointing out here, this is uh, what we call a posterior median sulcus, and then in the front here we have an anterior median fissure. Yeah, I think that'll do. Now you need to also know this off of a microscope slide, so let's do that now. What we have here is a nerve, or, or I'm sorry, this is a spinal cord slide. And it's a very beautiful spinal cord slide. What a gorgeous image this actually is. You can see some of the bits of nerve sticking out from the sides. And what makes this special to me, and again, other than the fact that you can see your horns and your funiculi here, so I could easily, oops, easily come in here and ask you about like posterior horns. I'm sorry, I'm bumping this, folks. It's not my intention. Let me see if I can just hold it steady. I could come in here quite easily and ask you about these posterior horns and things if I so chose. But what makes this kind of special from my perspective is as I zoom in, you can come over here if I fix my focus up a little bit. You can actually see the neurons, these nerve cell bodies inside of the gray matter. So I zoom this in a little bit further, see if we can get our focus on. Yeah. Look at that. So those are neurons. Can you see the neurons in there? Nice, clean neurons. These are in the gray matter. So that would be a neuron there and you can see the projections this would be from the nerve cell body so these would be axons and dendrites and then if i pan out from there that's all white matter so what you see there these are going to be axons moving around like here going out from a nerve which is in the gray matter sorry about the camera work here folks we do the best we can with what we got Okay, so that's the spinal cord. Let's go here. Uh, more breakdown. This is showing you the bits that I just was demonstrating. You got your dorsal horn, lateral horn, ventral horn. Uh, your funiculi would be in there as well, and the white matter. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, now the brain. Okay, so I've already run through the basic parts and pieces that I want you to be familiar with off of an image like this. And this is the kind of image you can basically expect on your exam. I probably will not use much in the way of dissection for the brain. 
Uh, I want to simply point out to you that when someone says that there's a nerve traveling through an area in the body, they're not talking about a single axon. A nerve, like a good peripheral neuron, or I'm sorry, a good peripheral nerve is going to be a housing of many axons, uh, all surrounded by multiple layers of external covering. Okay, so there will be many axons in a given nerve. I'm going to leave the details of this for lecture. However, in lab, where we're going to complicate this is you will need to know a lot about the nerves of the brain for lab. Okay, these are referred to as being the cranial nerves. The ones that you need to be best friends with are the first 12. Now, uh, there is a lot of information here. Okay, a lot of information. But luckily, Mr. Hopper has made this easy for you. You see, we can come over here to the computer and we can pull up Canvas. And when we pull up Canvas, you will find that I have uploaded a sheet for you. And that sheet has all the nerve names, how you sort of work them, their functions, and their um, type, if you will. All right, so you get your types and your functions and your names here. It's all on this sheet, which also includes a bunch of other really good information. So you need to go to Canvas, you need to print this sucker out and have it handy. It's gonna save your life as we go through and do this material. Let's finish this thing up. On the cranial nerves, the first 12 cranial nerves, I need to know their names, the neurons type, type meaning is it sensory or motor or both. It could be sensory, it could be motor, or it could have a mixed function. For my purposes, you just type both and we're in good shape. Okay, it's either sensory, motor, or both. And uh, then sort of what it does. Let me give you some examples of this. These are not as hard as it sounds. Uh, your first nerve coming off your brain is referred to as being your olfactory bulb. And if you look at a brain like so, you can see this projection here sticking out like right there. That is an olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulbs lay in those uh, cribriform foramina, the cribriform plates, on the skull like we talked about previously. Olfactory, smell. Can anything olfaction is smell. Uh, so it is an olfactory nerve. It's uh, tight. It is a sensory nerve. And then its function is olfaction, your capacity to sense, to sense smell. Okay, so question. Uh, what is the first nerve on your brain, olfactory? Is this nerve sensory, motor, or both? It's sensory. What is its general function? It deals with smell. The end. And a good follow-up question to that might be, where in the brain would this smell be interpreted? Okay, good way to look at it. All right, <clears throat> now, to learn the names and the types is a very simple process. You just have to memorize a mnemonic device set, and once you learn them, you will never, ever forget them. I haven't looked at this in months, and I can tell you that some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. Some say marry money. Sensory, sensory, motor, motor. Do you see how this works? It's, it's all here, okay, it's all here. Or alternatively, I can tell you that oh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet. Ah, okay. Oh, 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 olfactory, optic, oculomotor, two touch and, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens. It's not hard, okay? Learning the mnemonic devices is the complicated part, but I mean, if you can learn a freaking sentence, you can learn these mnemonic devices, uh, and then it, naming the nerves is pretty straightforward from then on out. Olfactory, uh, <clears throat> let me try again, let me give you the names. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibulo, cochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, hypoglossal. Now, let me lay a couple of uh, other concepts on you real quick. Anything ocu, that is going to be eye, okay, like optic. Uh, let's see here. Facial should be pretty obvious. Vestibulo, cochlear. Uh, this deals with your ear apparati, part of your inner ear called the vestibule, deals with your capacity for equilibrium. And then vestibulo cochlear, cochlea. The cochlea is the part of your ear that deals with literal hearing. So it shouldn't surprise you that these, uh, is a, this is a sensory nerve which deals with hearing and equilibrium. Glossopharyngeal. Okay, glossopharyngeal. I missed the L there. 
Uh, glossé means tongue. Anything glossé means tongue. Kind of like down here, hypo, hypoglossal. This means tongue. And then your pharynx is the area sort of in the back of your throat. You have a naso, oro, and laryngeopharynx in the back of your throat. Uh, so it should, should not surprise you that these deal with some of the musculature that allows you to swallow. Okay, so learning a little bit about the names here is going to be very important for us. Um, yeah, now just other little nuances, like if someone passes out, the neural condition from passing out from like something terrifying you and you pass out, that's referred to as being a vasovagal response. Uh, the vagus nerve sort of controls a lot of the internal organs and can cause all sorts of hell uh, under certain circumstances. So learning the vagus, you know, this is important. Like knowing these things, these are good. You need to know them. Now, let me say this. You need to know what I just described about all 12 nerves. But the first six, I'm going to point at it and you're going to have to tell me which one it is. All right, you've got to learn the locations of the first six. Uh oh, hang on. Technical difficulties. There we go. That works. And let's see. Yeah, here we go. So the first six cranial nerves are as follows. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor. These are all in the straight line. One, two, three. Okay, olfactory, optic, oculomotor. And then the other three that I want you to know are also in a straight line. They're just sort of on the side. They're on a, uh, what I would call an oblique angle. Okay, trochlear trigeminal abducens. Trochlear trigeminal abducens. Now, these are kind of weird. Let me describe to you what they actually look like. The olfactory bulbs are these huge, like nodules that just sit on the front of the brain. They're just hanging out there and they lay on those crepiform plates as we described previously. Those are the olfactory bulbs. The optic come out of the optic chiasma, which is like an X-shaped structure as you can see here. So you can see where the optic nerves would come in and then split off and come back to the um, occipital lobe of the brain. So olfactory and optic, and then the oculomotor nerves here, which kind of regulate some of the movement in the eyes. Uh, these are weird, man. They're completely flat, okay? They are they're flat as this bracelet, okay? They are really flat, but wide. And they have this kind of weird appearance as a result of this. They're quite flat, but wide. Uh, then we have the trochlear nerve here. The trochlear nerve kind of comes out from the cerebellum. So sort of between the cerebrum and the cerebellum, you have this trochlear nerve. The trochlear nerve is like a tiny little thin thread. Okay, it is small, small, small. It's easily torn off if you're not paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, the trochlear nerve is a little bitty thread just kind of sticking out there. So, yeah, you can see it better right there. Uh, trochlear trigeminal. The trigeminal nerves are massive. They are so big. Like they're hard to miss. It, it's like they're very large, very large, way bigger than the rest of these. Oh, like they're, they're the size of the optic nerves, which are also quite large. So you have trigeminals. You can see those sticking out there and there. Uh, there's a nodule of a trigeminal there. You can see it better here. And then the adducens kind of comes off the pons area. So sort of right there below the pons. You have these abducens, uh, or at the pond, I should say, right, right at the junction. These abducens are quite thin, almost like the trochlear nerves. Okay, so in a line, olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens. What I would do is I would point at one of these, I'll say, what nerve is that? You'll say it's an oculomotor nerve. And then I will say something like, uh, what type of nerve is it? Oh, well, that's a motor nerve. Then I'll say, what does it do? And you'll say it moves the eyes, regulates the pupils, something along those lines. If I were you, I would just stick to the first ones. <laughs> All right, good enough. All right, six nerves of the brain, olfactory bulbs, olfactory, optic nerves, optic, oculomotor nerves. You take the brain, turn it on its side, you go trochlear, this tiny little thing there, see it? Trigeminal would be this bump right here. You can see a bigger one over here. Then abducens, these tiny little things there and there. See them? Factory, optic, oculomotor, motor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens. So far so good? You're looking at this one, right? Give me a second. Next, let's do the internal structures. It'll go corpus callosum down to the fornix, 
over to the hypothalamus, up to the thalamus. See how round the thalamus is? Right? See how round it is? That'll come down to the pons, which is here, out the medulla oblongata, which is here. Then to the central canal and spinal cord. Well, just, we're just going to say spinal cord, okay. which is here. You can also see the arbor vitae. Looks like a tree, right? Mm -hmm. Branches and everything else. It's the white matter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. which is and also, if I kind of take this and pull it open, that is a lateral, lateral ventricle. And if I kind of dig in there and pull out, see this pink stuff? Mm -hmm. That is actually choroid plexus, what manufactures cerebrospinal fluid. Here, what I've done is I've taken the cerebellum, pulled it down. I can go in and pull down on the corpora quadrigemina. See one, two, three, four corpora quadrigemina, right? And then, once you pull down, you can kind of see that thing hanging down in there. See it? That thing hanging down is the pineal gland. So far, so good? All right. And that's going to be it for us. So that is a nice laboratory-based lecture on the parts of the brain and the general nervous system. Uh, you can expect the quiz to be popping up on this pretty soon. Thanks, guys.